Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session. I'm Vinita Senegaratna from Faculty of Medicine, Raghama, and I will be moderating the sixth webinar series program organized by Aura Media, collaboration with Students Affairs Division and Career Guidance Division of University of California. Today, I'm so excited to introduce the guest speakers for our session. Why am I excited? Because both of our resource persons are experts who contribute a great deal in improving the quality of life with the mission of building a healthy community in Sri Lanka. Our first guest speaker is an inspiring individual who is an experienced owner with a demonstrated history of working in the sports industry. He was a national level athlete who represented Sri Lanka in water polo and swimming since a very young age. And also, surely, he's a revolutionist who's trying to drive the sports in Sri Lanka to a better level, to be a challenging force in the world. Broadening his areas of expertise, both here and overseas, his experience as a high-performance sports coach and as a recreational exercise trainer led him to his current journey. Here to discuss on active lifestyle and ergonomics for busy bodies like you and me, Please welcome the founder of TAS Private Limited, Mr. Tanura Abhayavardhana. We welcome you warmly. Our next speaker is also a professional in an emerging branch of health services, which plays a wonderful role in managing common lifestyle disorders as well as sports injuries. He's a skilled in sports neurological, musculoskeletal and pediatric physiotherapy and he has obtained extensive work experience in Sri Lankan government hospitals, as well as overseas. We warmly welcome the Manager of Physiotherapy at TAS Private Limited, Mr. Shehan Tenwere. We welcome you both warmly, and it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Active lifestyle and ergonomics for busy bodies. That is our topic today. So, uh, Mr. Shehan Tenwere, you're an athlete yourself and you represented Sri Lanka several times from since a very young age uh, and also you are a person who is guiding the community guiding the community to enter a better lifestyle through active lifestyle through exercises so without further ado to discuss on the active lifestyle uh, for the busy bodies um, I will give, uh, turn the time over to you, Mr. Thanurashan, uh, Mr. Thanura Abhayavardhana. Time is yours. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Thanura. I'm uh, Niniti. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, I think you kept up on a pedestal. Uh, really, we are doing what we can to help the community. Um, so, thank you all for inviting us to talk on. Um, these topics, these topics are very passionate and we are very passionate about these topics and we are um, happy to talk and share what we know. Uh, hopefully we will make a little bit of change in your lives that will have a ripple effect in the future. Okay, can you guys see my presentation? Is it visible? Shan, is it visible to everyone? It's visible, Sandra. Yeah, I can see the presentation. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, all good. All right, brilliant. Okay, so health and wellness. So I'll come to the topic uh, throughout the uh, presentation. I'll come to the topic where you guys are busy and time is a constraint and what you guys need to do. But uh, let me touch base on the basics first. And I hope uh, I won't be too elementary for you guys, but I think it's important for us to cover all bases before we go forward. And my next uh, slide is going to put me in trouble. I hope I won't be in too much trouble for the next slide. So doctors, sorry, you are just as unhealthy as your patients. Uh, fortunately, I'm not the person to say it. Uh, it was one of a, one. Uh, it was um, an article featured in 2017 uh, in one of the uh, medical journals. So, why do we say that? Let's answer that question together. Let's see whether that is correct or incorrect, or whether they. 
Uh, and let's discuss about that uh, during the summary. So topics I'll be covering today, are a brief introduction to wellness, and I will explain why I call it wellness and not just exercise. Um, exercise and wellness, how can exercise contribute to wellness? Uh, and I had a chat with Diniti before doing this presentation, and there are some common questions that you guys have asked, and I'm planning on answering uh, four of them, which will cover most of the questions, I believe. And uh, the basic exercise guidelines that comes uh, very uh, central to uh, the work we do. Um, so a uh, brief introduction about myself. I've done my master's in exercise and science, uh, and my research is in recovery mainly. All right. So uh, I'm the founder of TAS, and our objective has been and will be to build a healthy community. So that is a tough thing to do because uh, a healthy community, by definition, is a difficult thing to say. It can be overweight. It can be disease. Uh, it can be just inactivity. Um, and there's no age limit. There's no gender uh, issues. There's no start. There's no stop. When to start. So everything is up in the air. So there's no starting point. So building a healthy community is very generic or very open. So that's why it's very difficult. So right now, based on the data we have at the moment, um, if you take the entire island, uh, almost uh, one third of the people are, uh, I would say, um, susceptible to uh, NCDs. And uh, almost 86% uh, of them are not into physical activity in terms of leisure, right? If they're physical activity due to work, yes, they have. but uh, with the objective of uh, being uh, healthy, 86.7% of people don't exercise. And uh, we were also quite shocked when we saw these numbers, but these are the latest data we have at the moment. So non-communicable diseases, a little bit of stats, uh, global stats for you guys. Uh, the biggest health risk uh, for employees in the corporate sector, non-communicable diseases, and uh, 35 million people each year, equivalent to 67.9 of all the deaths globally are due to NCDs, right? And um, so these are the stats on these NCDs. These are uh, generally what people uh, catch and uh, catch as in due to their uh, un unhealthy lifestyles or life that, that might not be 100% suitable for uh, them. So as I said at the start, uh, what is wellness? Why do I say wellness without uh, saying it's all about exercise, right? So wellness uh, is not only, sorry. Okay, wellness is not only the absence of uh, disease or illnesses, right? It's a complex combination of physical, mental, emotional, and social happiness. Why do we say emotional and social happiness? Because I think the biggest problem uh, we have in the working sector right now, that including the professionals and people in the corporate is stress. And uh, so if you don't have your emotional and the social surrounding, that can cause stresses uh, mentally and physically. Uh, wellness is an active pro pro uh, process of becoming aware. So that's a big point because becoming aware is you understanding, not uh, doing it because someone else is doing it, but you understanding and making a choice towards a healthy, healthy and happy lifestyle, right? So guys, therefore, the re reason why I've used wellness is because you can't merely run an exercise program and come out uh, disease-free or illness-free or have mental and physical peace. You need to understand the notion of wellness and the wellness notion is very important, right? Why is it important for you, right? Uh, uh, if you guys haven't heard of Ranjan Das, he's, uh, he was uh, one of the biggest CEOs in, in, in the world at one point or the youngest CEO to uh, run a big, big, big company. Um, he was very active, extremely active. He would hit the gym every day. 
uh, he would have a superb diet. He would work hard, be inspirational to his staff. So if I can ask you guys, do you know why he had an unfortunate death at the age of 42? It's a question out to you guys. If anyone wants to answer, or is, is it possible for anyone to answer? Do you want to have a raise of hands or something? Or you can type it on the chat box. Perfect. Stress. Uh, yes, it is linked to stress. It is. Is it because of a cardiac arrest? Yes, it is because of cardiac arrest. Why do you think? So they pin it down. Lack of sleep. So he used to sleep only three to four hours a day. So clearly that wasn't recommended. Uh, so, so that's why, guys, we have to understand the entire process of wellness, not just one part of it. And unfortunately, for this great man, he missed out on that. Uh, so, with his death thoughts, he's teaching us so many things. Uh, and uh, we should appreciate that. And also, the other thing is, I think you guys are all late 20s, probably early 30s, or at least most of you guys. Or you are in early 20s. I'm not sure which age range. I'm really sorry about that. I should have asked before. Uh, but, yep. Uh, and can you guys, um, so you guys think that, um, so then there was another research that I read, like, can you make up for years of poor eating? Uh, it, says that, yeah, it says that it's difficult to undo what is done. However, I uh, think um, you can actually make some change. Probably you can't undo it, but you can actually redirect it to a better state than continuing it in the same way. So uh, since I'm... Uh, Talking to a younger uh, younger audience, I would like to say, start now. Don't think, okay, after I pass out, when I get to a good stable state economically, I can change my life. Guys, that doesn't happen. Uh, so what your good habits now or the habits that you have now is what you will take forward. And if you have any bad habits, try to reduce it or completely get rid of it now. So... Uh, that's why I wanted to bring this example. Uh, why wellness? A healthy community. Uh, you need to be happy first, guys. It's not only um, economic happiness. It's also a holistic happiness that you need. You need to be happy with what you do. Uh, you need to have a positive attitude. You need to be productive to this uh, 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 community, to this world. You need to be fit, which is part of our role. Uh, free of illnesses, that's a health concept, uh, self-confidence to go forward, to do what you like to do, and mindfulness is to have uh, emotional and mental peace. So wellness is all of it, guys. So uh, wellness is a multidimensional model. So there are many models. This is a model that we go by at TAS. So it's a six, it has six components. And we believe that exercise through can cover at least at least three of these uh, uh, components of wellness. So uh, physical exercise can help you physically and mentally, uh, mentally in terms of feel, feel good factor or feeling calm if you're doing continuous exercises uh, as in long, slow distance. Um, so like end off in release, so on and so forth. So when you exercise, you fall into communities that is different from work, different from home, where you meet different people. So the social as aspect is developed. And the environment, you always change the environment when you exercise. So at TAS, what we do is we, we have three different locations or three different places as we train. So we get them out of office to outdoors. We bring them inside the gym or we take them to a ground and we ensure that the environment is always different in terms of the physical environment. And also the, uh, the, the entire feeling of 
either working out early morning or exercising, being with the community in the in the morning or in the evening after work, st relieving stress. So wellness has a direct correlation uh, with exercise. The only few things that we cannot probably uh, move into is uh, the mental and the, uh, the the spiritual and the emotional aspect of it. Sometimes exercise has a correlation with emotion. Sometimes it doesn't. And uh, exercise can, certain exercises can have a spiritual aspect to it, but not all exercise. So um, wellness through exercise uh, or exercise uh, towards wellness has can cover many components, but not all. So benefits of exercise, improve health. So I, I, I don't have to go through this one by one. You guys understand it. There are many benefits, uh, but it doesn't uh, pertain into one or two or three. But it also doesn't have to be the benefit that has for someone else. So exercise benefits. So for example, I have clients who come in the morning. Uh, they come, come, come in at about 4.45 in the morning, although when we train at we start at five and um, they train till about 6, 6.30 and they go off. And uh, some of them do that because it's part of their routine. So for them, the benefit is more uh, emotional and mental. And uh, some of them come for aesthetic. So it doesn't have to be for uh, one thing or the other. It can be for all or it can be for just uh, a mental sort of way of relaxing. So have I, um, do you have any questions up till then? Or shall I move on to the just basic questions uh, so that uh, I think we cover the common questions first. I think we'll do that. So the one question that uh, Dinity said that most of you guys will ask about uh, exercise per se, uh, would be ergogenic aids. So uh, by definition, an ergogenic aid can be broadly defined as a technique or the way or a substance used uh, for the purpose of enhancing performance, right? Anabolic steroids not permitted in my field. Or I don't think it should be, uh, but uh, people take it. And uh, as people in your profession, I'm sure I don't need to explain further <laughs> as to what they are. So uh, some uh, sort of supplementation that is used, I think I'm I'm preaching to all the guys who are exercising here. Sorry, ladies, I'll get back to you all with the next question probably. Uh, so some uh, proteins and uh, can be used uh, and they are permitted. Uh, they use for many reasons, mainly. So protein is mainly used for recovery. It's a building, the anabolic. So mainly protein works uh, predominantly after exercise to help you rebuild. And also there are slow acting proteins uh, like casein, which are used uh, in sleep uh, when, you're, when you're sleeping so that it helps you rebuild. But in general sense, uh, a protein is used uh, for building. and uh, for making so anabolic, so uh, so some protein, so, some supplements are taken for hydration for long distance running, and if you're exercising for long distance, so we like to stick to um, family and mix it with a bit of salt and maybe a bit of sugar if you need to, and try to avoid taking uh, uh, commercial products uh, off the shelf, but. You can use a mix of all these if you want to exercise. However, I'm not a fan of uh, any sort of supplementation which cannot be uh, substituted by food that we eat, uh, which can be substituted by food that we eat. Therefore, you don't need to have anything uh, other than the normal food unless you're competing at a different level uh, or you want to get to a different stage of your exercise. Okay. Um, so that's what I have to tell you about supplementation. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, 
So I, I get a lot of questions about protein and what types of protein should you take? So whey protein is, uh, which is commonly used by everyone uh, uh, in, in the general population and in sport. And there are three types of whey protein that we use the concentrate, the isolate and the hydro uh, uh, lysate. Uh, so they are of different compounds. So basically uh, the hydro lysate is the one that is easy to digest and isolate is the one that is pure. And uh, these are these have all the nine uh, amino acids that are essential. So essential amino acids, I'll just go through this because I'm pretty sure you guys know it, but I'll just say it because I think uh, just in case uh, if someone doesn't. Uh, so we produce about 11 in our body and nine we have to take from uh, the sources that we have and we need to eat. Uh, so this supplementation, uh, carries all nine so it, they're complete and um, so having them has no harm but uh, if you can have a normal food and get these in perfect or if you can have a mix of these it's good enough and casein is a slow digestive protein that i spoke about before you can have also plant-based proteins like uh, soy peas and rice good for vegans and there are egg-based proteins for people who are lactose intolerant, right? Uh, sorry, guys, do you have any questions about proteins and supplementation that you guys want to ask me? Any questions, boys? And girls? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, of course. You can uh, write it on the chat uh, if you don't want to be identified, that's fine. I'll move on. So the next one was, I think Dimitri told me was, okay, all of you guys have New Year resolutions and so on and so forth. Um, and you guys always start something, but you'll find it very difficult to finish it or the commitment is probably oh, the motivation dies down and it doesn't convert into commitment, right? So motivation is what gets you started. So that's, I think all of us have that, right? Uh, so say we go in front of a mirror, we see a little bit of a pot or we climb up the stairs and we feel tired uh, or we see someone or we have a wedding to go to party to go to, whatever, that's where the motivation kicks in, right? Okay, I need to do this. But halfway through, what happens is, oh my God, I can't do this. I have more important things. That is where the problem starts, okay? This we go day in and day out with our clients, right? So that is where the problem starts. Then you start finding excuses for yourself, right? I have too much of work. I don't have time during the day, right? Uh, other priorities are more important, right? Such as probably picking up the kids, uh, ensuring you're there for the kids, or uh, meeting your other, uh, meeting your partner, uh, going home for your parents, uh, cooking food, whatever. So everything becomes a priority uh, in your life, right? Uh, there are questions. Sorry, let me see. Yeah. yeah, the studies. Due to studies, we also um, skip the things I have to do studies and. Uh, of course, so everything becomes an excuse, right? So then, for me, what I tell my clients is, all of that is valid. All of that is valid. Also, what is valid are NCDs, right? So what I tell my clients uh, like generally is that your body understands only routine, right? Your body understands only routine. Your body does not understand anything else. Your body understands only routine. So if you, if you go in a certain pattern, the body says, okay, this is how I'll behave. If you change the pattern, the body will adapt according to that pattern and then go along that pattern, right? So if you want to get fit, okay, there's a certain requirement that you need to fulfill. And the body needs to, and the body understands that. Just because all of a sudden you get an exam 
and you stop the pattern and change the pattern, what happens? The body changes the pattern, right? And then you move towards your NCDs, right? Does the body understand, oh, this is priority, therefore I need to change? No, body doesn't. Right? So guys, when you start something, if you want to commit, right, I have a scale for you. So motivation is always heavy at the start. What happens is it changes. So the commitment has to be heavy later. But what happens is you guys forget. So there are certain tricks in this trade that you can use to keep your, uh, not your motivation up, but to keep your com uh, commitment up. So that is to celebrate small wins. So if you get on a scale and if you have uh, lost 500 grams, don't think about the 10 kilos that you have to lose. Celebrate the 500 grams uh, that you have lost. There are reasonable goals, right? So say, tell yourself, I am going to exercise three times a day. And exercise meaning not only going to the gym. I will walk for 45 minutes. So if I miss going to the gym, I will walk from my workplace to, the, uh, to my house. That's an exercise. Right? Sorry. Uh, find a training person who, who can, who can uh, exercise with you. When I say exercise guy, it doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym. Can be any sort of exercise, right? Yoga to walking to any physical activity, right? Accept that you have bad days. So when you have a training partner, that actually helps you. So when you have a bad day, that doesn't mean the training partner will have a bad day, right? Therefore, that will help you. Uh, and fear of failure. So you, you have a target, you have a goal, you achieve only 75% of it. That's okay. That's fine. Think of it as the glass is half full or three quarter full. Not Don't think about the quarter that is empty. Because the quarter that is empty is the one that will bring you down. Not the three quarter that is full. So those are the little tips that we give our clients and always talk to our clients about when they uh, come up with or when their motivation is low, for example. So uh, one client would come and say, oh, I wanted to lose one kilo a week. And at the end of the month, I have lost only three kilos. And you say, well, that's better than not losing any kilos. So the small wins, the small goals, uh, and, the, and the people around you, the social factor, will take you forward. So that is my advice to you in terms of what happens in your busy life. How can you work around it to ensure that uh, you can get uh, uh, you can get towards your goals? So one example that I remember while telling you guys is that we had a small corporate challenge for a company which in Biagama, right? So we had some ladies who are very busy Thank you, you guys, probably. So we put a um, uh, a Fitbit on their uh, wrist, and we were we were checking the amount of uh, steps that they cover during the day. So the guys used to go for runs and cover and all that. Now these ladies who had to go home and cook for the kids. So what they did was they were walking around the house while cooking just to get the steps in. So for me. For me, that was the biggest win rather than getting the getting people going to a gym and working out because they were finding ways and methods of keeping that uh, goal alive rather than letting go saying, oh, I got to cook. So that was a good motivator for us. And uh, that's one of the examples that I want to bring in in terms of motivation versus commitment. In the next question is age, gender, and your current exercise status. That was a question that was asked. Guys, do you have any questions of the previous one? Motivation versus commitment, personal experiences that I can help you guys with? Yeah, I guess uh, you covered it in a great amount and we got a really good understanding on that because that was a crucial question that everyone asked about because um, how to keep going once we start that was the question uh, among our busy schedules it's 
not because we are busy but it's because lack of commitment if we set our mind up and set up achievable goals we can achieve it so thank you very much i think you covered it up very well yeah thanks diniti and at the same time fear of failure guys it's okay to fail right it's okay not to achieve your goal you'll be upset for one day next day get up have a new goal and move forward that is what that is what commi uh, commitment is about right all right next one age gender and current status sorry my my picture is a bit off so current status is the most important uh, rather than gender and age i don't think really age and gender has a massive impact but well for it all are you fit and healthy to achieve your goal you set so for example if someone says oh i want to lose 10 kilos okay first question you need to ask yourself is am i ready to lose 10 kilos not only physically am i ready to lose 10 kilos mentally and physically that's when you probably needs a bit of help where you go to someone a professional in the field it may be a dietitian he may, may may be a scientist can be a person who has a bit of experience and ask what do you do to do this okay or watch some good good informative youtube tips not just random ones and maybe some research right and you can do yourself a self assessment you can get them to do an assessment of you and understand where you are a starting point and then see whether your goal is whether your goal matches your current status in terms of your health and in terms of your uh, level of fitness so that is where your current status is most important then age a lot of people say i have seen i have heard however much I, however much we tell it is very difficult to change the mindset of people but the older you get the most important type of exercise would be strength training because cardiovascular training has a lot of wear and tear what it will do is it will bring down or reduce or create more atrophy than hypertrophy as a result will go towards oa right so what we want to people to do is yes have a bit of cardiovascular exercise the older you get however concentrate a lot more on your strength training the good best example i can give you is that my mom probably needs a knee replacement but we are prolonging it by doing strength training we are prolonging it as much as we can so that we we might have to at some point but maybe not now under the guidance of the doctor to uh and she's doing a lot of strength training at the gym she's meeting the physio she's having that chat having the conversation at the age of 70 and trying to do something about it so strength training is very important the older you get but strength training is important at any point of your life um and there's a lot of research now that says that strength training might be uh not might be is definitely beneficial for uh, every type of training so cardiovascular training is important but strength training might be the most important right uh and the next one is gender guys to be honest i do not see a difference between gender and sadly i feel that girls you all feel that you all are going to be like this when you lift weights it's never going to happen this is definitely due to anabolic steroids unless you take anabolic steroids this is never ever 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 i don't want i don't i can't say how much i can emphasize that is never ever i have never seen in my lifetime a person getting this much of muscle definition a girl especially um uh, due to weight training unless they have some sort of uh, external like anabolic steroids guys yes you have lot more testosterone in your body therefore you can look like this if you will not exactly like this but close to this uh if you do certain amount of diet and exercise and training and sleep and so on and so forth and um the best example that i can bring is i have a current uh lady who is pregnant i train a lot of prenatal clients um 
who runs 10 kilometers a day. And uh, there's no problem with it. So I don't think gender or, uh, has any impact on it. And, and, and that girl running 10 kilometers a day, being pregnant, uh, talks about her current status. She's a marathon runner. She's pregnant. If I stop her from running, she's going to uh, be depressed du during her entire pregnancy and maybe after her pregnancy. I'd rather keep her happy within the frame for a safe framework. She's not running the 21s and the 42s anymore. But I'm getting her to run 10K. That's fine. She's perfectly fine. The baby is healthy. She's going to give birth probably in another two months. And she ran the entire entire during her entire pregnancy. So there's no problem. So a gender, I don't think is really important, but current status. How healthy are you? Have you been a previous athlete and you haven't trained for the next past five years? Well, you're at zero. Tough. You being an athlete, probably mentally will help, but physically will take some time for you to get back. So understand your current status. That is the most important thing I would like to say. Yeah. Any questions on current status? Yeah, so gender doesn't matter, no. I mean, there's no need to get a discrimination because we are as fit as you guys. So any question from the audience? Uh, yes, uh, but my question is actually, I'm sorry, it's uh, it's regarding uh, the previous uh, section so about uh, the motivation commitment part. Um, in it, uh, I feel like there's this, I don't know, uh, is there a way to tackle this uh, conundrum of where you, you know, you're trying to be idealistic versus realistic of like, um, when we uh, in in the case of medical student in particular, uh, where obviously um, time is a factor, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, we can like you said, obviously, you know, uh, there are so many obligations, things that uh, we and everyone has to do, and uh, a lot of times uh, we have to bask at them as excuses. But um, it's like um, even when you take that uh, case of uh, that that youngest CEO, uh, Ranjan, um, is Ranjan. Uh, he, I mean, in that case, uh, he was an individual with uh, a lot of motivation, commitment, and obviously uh, so many responsibilities, and he didn't really have any excuses, but time was uh, a factor on his end as well, and he tried to combat that by uh, uh, compromising his sleep, and that, well, um, kind of negatively affected him at the end. I mean, uh, can we, I mean, obviously there are, some like few people who still can i guess manage and do everything but when it comes to like uh generally speaking students uh i mean is it just because of the fact that they can't manage and uh, they uh, just cannot uh, commit or i mean is there a way to sort of uh, uh, uh like the ideal scenario is of course uh, balancing everything not really considering those as excuses and uh, kind of and sleeping and doing everything right but uh realistically um yeah i mean in particular to medical students i mean is there i mean how uh how can a student really uh kind of you know um tackle that situation uh starting from little steps or something i mean i'm not sure yeah. so i will check uh that's a good question i also want to uh, maybe ask you a question so what is ideal to you uh, ideal, I would say ideal would obviously be me balancing my studies and other obligations as well as uh, paying enough attention to my physical well-being. Uh, yeah. so, so, so it's very subjective. So that's what I want to get to, right? So what is ideal to you might be not ideal to someone else, right? So what you, what any human being, you, me, anyone, we need to understand limitations, right? For example, say I want to go uh, climb Everest tomorrow. Okay, can I manage my time to do that? No, I can't. Why? Because I have kids, I have family, I run a business, I can't. So that's why I said the goals have to be reasonable. 
right? But Ranjan Das didn't understand. Well, with all due respect to him, I don't want to talk. Let's not talk about Ranjan Das, but let's talk about an individual who's 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 not sleeping but prioritizing everything else. Is that a smart thing to do? No, no, not really. Not really. So maybe he needs to work around something else in his life that he doesn't harm his health first. So you need to have priorities in your life. So probably um, that's as that's I spoke about before. It's not economic. That is priority. Yes, at, at, at a young age, that's what you aspire to have, right? We understand. All of us do. But I think health should come first, right? You need to survive. You need to live to do everything else, right? So then you have a, you write down a priority list. Okay, some things you can do it this year. Some things you can do it next year. We don't know. That depends on your personality, on what you want to do. Right, maybe you want to ace your exams this year. Right, if you want to ace your exam this year, you're not going to fill your schedule with exercise and sleeping and working and and diet and making your food right and all that. You won't do that. Why? Because your priority is the other one. But within that priority of of um, becoming the number one in the batch, okay. What you can do is, like I said before, walk home. Mm. Okay, walk to your this thing. Uh, walk to your wherever you live, probably your hostel or home or whatever, right? Because yeah, I studied abroad, we used to walk to hostel. I used to cycle. Like uh, it takes thirty minutes in the freeway to go to my uni, and if I cycle, also it takes thirty minutes because there's no traffic, so I would cycle. Right. So I wouldn't waste time. I'll be a bit more tired, but I wouldn't waste time. So, like little things within the framework of your goal, you change. That's what you do. And the next year, what happens is those little things become wider and bigger. And you can change a lot more things. You become better at managing time. So, that's also a skill. So, so first make small changes in your life. And that will help you make bigger changes in your life. So, um. So it's a very good question because I think something I missed, I understood by that question. There's nothing in absolution, guys. You can't take everything in absolution. It doesn't have to be from point A to point B. It can be around the obstacles to point B. It doesn't matter. Because you all you're are on a journey. You all are not just going to a destination. That journey will have trees and rocks and mountains and slopes and whatnot. But end of the day, that journey will give you that experience of time management, life management, so on and so forth. So nothing can happen overnight. So make the goals reasonable. I think if it's point two, if you looked at point two, that would have answered the question as well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So it's basically being aware of the current situation and then making those little changes around things that you can and yeah, progress. And, and also prioritizing what you really yeah. want in life. Yeah. And understanding that health is very important, but also at a young age, you can you can again at a young age manu around it if you want to. Better than us. I would say me. I don't want to put anyone else there. Better than me, because I'm five years older. But uh, definitely better than me. You can. You have. You have a better choice in terms of probably breaking rest a bit more than me as well. Thank you. No worries. Any other question? So, so we should learn to compromise and understand our potential and our priorities, and keep going. Yeah, but also aiming for the stars, okay, guys? Just don't compromise in terms of what you want to do. But there is always a way around something. That's what you need to understand. So, if there are no more questions, shall we move on? Yes, um, I am. Am I, yeah, this is Tiara. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, Mr. Abhivardhana, Sistihara, um, my question is related to one of the points that were mentioned in one of the initial slides. It said that it 86.7% um, out of the population do not uh, are not indulged in exercise, and I'm afraid to say that I am also amongst them. Um, so the thing is, my, I'm fortunate to have friends who encourage me to do or to exercise, but the thing is, I find it very hard or difficult um, to initiate or, or to um, do them because I feel very tired. It hurts, um, for, in, for instance, um, I feel like I need a longer period of rest or maybe can't keep up with the exercise. Um, so if there's an if there's something um, to overcome that, how not to? Why do I feel tired like that? And a way to overcome it. And the other question is, um, just a couple of minutes ago, you just mentioned that walking. Okay, well, I do understand it's kind of subjective um, as how wellness is to a certain individual. But then again. Um, if I were to ask how effective is walking uh, for like, let's say 20 minutes to uh, exercising, like hard exercises for 10 to 15 minutes as a person who does, does not exercise at all. And uh, me personally, I do not exercise, exercise at all. And um, I find it hard. It hurts. So as a, for, for a person like me, what would you recommend, like a difficult or hard uh, cardio for like 15 and 20 minutes or walking for 20 minutes? How efficient would that be? Okay. I'm not sure if I was clear. Am I, was I clear? Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, so what is the name? Sorry, I saw it for brief. The... Um, this was Tihara. Yeah. Tihara, what... What will you enjoy in terms of physical activity? Walking or a hard workout? Oh, well, walking would it certainly be because um, when you, if it's hard, I mean, when it's like hard cardio, it definitely hurts a lot. I can't keep up. I can't go for like 20 minutes at a stretch or even let's say you do a 20 minutes workout uh, within a given period of one hour. I still can't do it. So compared to that, I would prefer walking. Then walk. No issues. Because you need to... Would that be that. efficient as like uh, for matter. the wellness? What matters is you walking first. You're walking and getting that confidence, number one. Right? I think I, <laughs> somewhere. Getting that confidence which you lack right now. Right? What you said was, from all what you said, I understood is you're not confident enough mentally here yeah, you're here you don't have that self-confidence mentally to uh, work out with your friends why yes and 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 the fear of failure so those are the two things that you're uh, missing right so if you enjoy walking and if you think walking uh, and and walking does help right i also walk on my off days I get up in the morning. I think I'm going to run 10 kilometers. I can't take five steps. And I'm like, oh, God. Okay. But something's better than nothing. I'm just going to walk. So I walk that duration. So my 10 kilometers is roughly under an hour. So what I do is I walk under an hour. I probably get three kilometers. In. Doesn't matter. I'm three kilometers closer to my goal than I was before. Well, I'm seven kilometers shorter than the goal that I wanted to, but it's a, it's a, you know, half, the glass is half full. I'm not going to think about the glass that is half empty. That's going to demotivate me. Why would I want to think about that? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yes, I certainly do. Yep. So you make those baby steps. You walk five minutes. If that's five minutes that you can do. Then the next time you try to walk six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes, without you knowing you're walking for 40 minutes. When you're when you're at about 30, 40 minutes, go try your exercises that your friends are doing. 
and you will surprise yourself or guarantee that. So again, it's a journey. Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah, you certainly have. Um, and also the um, previous one, like why do I feel so tired? Is it because of the same reason, like lack of confidence, um, because the fear of failure? I, you know, I why? think so, and also definitely physical fitness for sure. But physical fitness is something that you can overcome in about two, three weeks. It's not a problem. But the rest of it is something that will take some time. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep, I got it answered. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think so. You answered that question very well because even I can relate to Tihara because I even experienced the same thing as her. Uh, but I now understand it's better to have something than to do nothing. Correct. Beautiful. Any more questions, guys? I'm happy to answer. It's better than doing a presentation. All right, we'll move on. Uh, anyone wanted to answer? We'll move on. We'll move on, right? Recovery modality is in. Sorry? Let's move on, sir. Yeah, recovery modality is in sleep. Ooh, but most of you guys don't have. Okay. So, when it comes to exercise, what is more important? Diet. Diet is a form of recovery, that's what I think, right? Because if you diet only, you get your energy. That's regenerating recovery. 50% is diet. 25% is exercise and 25% is rest. How important is sleep for recovery? I know as students, y'all don't get it. I understand, right? But I have to tell you the right thing. You need seven to nine hours of sleep if you want to have some sort of physical change in your body, right? Uh, Losing even a few hours of sleep, you have a different of a cognitive. So I want to bring in cognitive function is because you guys think you can cram for an exam overnight and go and write the exam. Man, that's going to be really tough to ace that exam. I have tried it, tried and tested. But um, so your body, that's how it works. So sleep is very important, guys. There are other modalities, massage, ice bath. Um, my thesis is on, is on recovery, so I know. Uh, massage, ice bath, uh, what, what do they do? Uh, they do stretching. They think about everything else, everything but sleep. And all the sleep study says there's no point doing anything. I'm talking in terms of athletes, right? Uh, no point doing anything if you don't sleep for a good seven to nine hours. So at least I would say, I would tell my clients it's in, in this busy environment, at least get six to six and a half hours. If not, don't come and speak to me. I have clients who want to come at, as I said, at 4.40 in the morning. I said, don't come and talk to me if you have a late night. Because it's a waste of, a, of the entire program that we have planned for you. So uh, for our athletes, if they miss their sleep one or two days, their entire one-year program can get messed up. So that's how important sleep is. Because it has residual fatigue, uh, that, that concept coming in, right? So sleep deprivation, memory issues, mood swings, risk of diabetes, low sex drive, that's a very important for you guys. Concentration issues, uh, high blood pressure, weight gain. Now basically, if you have sleep, if you are deprived of sleep, you're going to have a lot of problems. And I know you guys are going to be resident doctors, you're going to be overnight, on call, but uh, end of the day, this is what it is, this is reality. This is what is going to happen, this is, this is the research. So no one can, this thing, yes, you can get away from it for a few years probably, but then it's going to catch up at some point. So be smart about the decisions you make at a young age. Uh, any questions on sleep? Apart from the fact that you guys are deprived. Yeah. Although than any therapy, sleep is important. But uh, I guess we should pay more attention into it because uh, before it hinders our efficiency, 
it's better to get uh, at least the minimum amount of sleep. Yeah, so, and, and yeah. If, you, if you miss something, just try to catch up on your sleep. That's the only thing I can say because residual fatigue can actually build up where you can crash at some point. So we don't want that happening. Okay, I'll move on to nutrition. So I'm just going to go through nutrition quickly. We've taken a lot of time and I think Shan is waiting to do his ergonomics, right? So carbs, fats and proteins, macros, micros, are vitamins, minerals and organic compounds. I think during COVID and uh, and after COVID, I think micros became like really important. Everyone was talking about vitamin D. Oh my God, we're not getting vitamin D. They don't want to, they didn't want to stand out in the sun, but they wanted to take a pill. And uh, uh, there's no point standing out in the sun with sunblock and covering yourself. Yeah, it doesn't make sense for vitamin D. But uh, uh, but micros are as important. Uh, ADEC, ADEK, uh, very important for you guys. Uh, as as important as macros for absorption and solubility. So carbohydrate, proteins, and fats. Very basic stuff. There are. Uh, good fats and bad fats. Coconut was bad five years ago, six years ago. Now coconut is the best. So research change. So be updated about the research. And um, uh, oils, in terms of oils, uh, fish has a lot of good oil. Uh, the ratio omega-3 to omega-6. So all those matter. I think you guys are well aware of that. If you have any questions, you can ask. I'm just going to go through it. So... 7 to 10 grams of uh, carbohydrates. Uh, this is for a, a balanced diet, okay? This is not to lose weight. Please don't misunderstand. Uh, so 7 to 10 grams of carbohydrates is required. Um, roughly uh, 0 0.66 grams per kilo of body weight. But I think the newer standard, if you want to look, if you're gymming and stuff, it's 1.2. And if you're an athlete, it can go up to 1.5, 1.6 grams of protein per body weight and 10 to 15 or less than 10 to 15 percent of fat and out of which it has to be good fat, right? Extreme diets are fats or a fashion. It is a fashion. So ketogenic diet, I think, I think, well, I don't want to take names, but there are a lot of heart attacks due to keep, not a lot, but there is certain part of evidence for ketogenic diet and for cardiovascular issues. Uh, vegan diet, uh, tough. Vegan diet is tough, especially in Sri Lanka. Uh, vegan food is not available. Atkins is high protein, high fats, uh, probably same as keto or close to keto. And some people like to eat food raw and organic. Trust me, I'm, I've met all four types of these people. and. Uh, it's tough. When this happens, it's tough. I have a, I have a girl who is uh, uh, type 2 diabetes and vegan. Man, that's really tough to manage. right? So you have to, again, understand limitations of yourself and try not to go into popular diets, extreme diets, right? and move into a more sustainable diet that you can do based on your economy, based on your time, based on things that you can best manage uh, and try to work with a diet within that framework rather than trying to go into uh, extreme diets such as this. Any questions on that? It seems like there are no questions, sir. I will move on. Everyone is running late, eh? So, uh, exercise, components of exercise, cardiovascular and respiratory good for your heart and circular uh, vascular system and uh, muscle and strength. That is what I feel is the most important. If you're doing a program, concentrate at least 60% into strength training. Does not mean you're lifting weights, guys. Now, if you can see this picture, this person is not lifting any weights, but that's still strength training. Okay. So strength training does not mean you're lifting weights. Okay. It's not weight training. So flexibility, speed and agility. And for me, the biggest thing is recovery. That's why I brought in as the fifth component. 
so stretching sleep hydration nutrition uh, ice bath massage you name it everything is recovered okay so if you are doing the four components of physical movement you need to have at least 25% of that time allocated for recovery boom how much of exercise do you need it depends on what you want and the calories so if you want to gain weight you probably need to eat more and probably exercise in a way that you're gaining weight probably not exercise less but if you want to lose weight you lose the calories it's a calorie deficit that's the only way you gain and lose deficit or increase so type of work matters your basal metabolic rate those are too technical it doesn't need to matter important leisure and recreational activity that 86.7% we're talking about was not work but leisure so your health what your health status is your age in terms of cardiovascular strength like i told you before the old you get probably concentrate more on uh, more on uh, strength training quickly go into the summary guidelines guys at least 300 minutes of exercise in moderate intensity if you can per week modest weight loss is 1 kilo a week nothing more adequate rest and, and the diet has to be the uh, are important uh, uh, are as important as uh, or even more important than exercise the goal standard of losing weight maximum energy utilization is running running at high intensity at the uh, and utilizes the most amount of calories whereas as moderate intensity uses less but however if you are not used to running walking is good enough okay for an untrained individual uh, like i said if i untrained individual running is an extended period may be challenging i've answered that so say injury free running is uh, you don't have to run and also what i told about partner training right those are the main things that you need to cover any questions so uh, do i have a question or is the same question yes sir. i think we have if a question in the chat box yeah i saw that if you want to build muscle what is the sequence of the course man i don't know to answer that if you want to build muscle what is the sequence of workouts there are so many permutations and combinations to that question um it, you that's not direct answer so first thing is uh, if i want, if you want to build muscle uh, i can't say that because i don't know what kind of uh, uh, level you are at sorry uh, it is whether to do less cardio and more strength uh, uh, training and the proportion of the exercises i think but i can't answer that without knowing who i'm talking to as in where that person is as in whether that person's uh, baseline fitness level is level. good uh <laughs> so 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 for me if you want to if you want to build muscle and you have your beginner level i would say there are four ways of there, there are four steps right four phases of training right so the endurance phase the hypertrophy phase the strength phase and the power phase right those are the general four phases right so you have to go uh, at least 3 to 4 weeks of each phase but that's also very subjective right after you get to a yeah after you get to a certain level then whether you are moving to the next phase or not is decided based on your stats at that point so i would loosely say please do not quote me i would loosely say that there are four phases roughly about 16 weeks four weeks per phase okay the four phases are endurance hypertrophy strength and power i'm sorry really sorry that i can't answer it very directly yeah any other question so you gave a general answer uh, for that question uh, so i wish I'm really we sorry about that dos really sorry i can um, uh, ticking and we have to talk about uh, another topic about the ergonomics and i think it was a marvelous presentation and 
I don't think anyone could have explained about this content any way better more than this. So uh, it was our pleasure to have you here, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tanura Bevadamo. And sorry, guys, these uh, are my contact details. If you all want to contact me and ask any questions, please do. Uh, my phone number, my email, and on Instagram, whatever. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So uh, I think uh, you got a storehouse of knowledge uh, on the topic that active lifestyle and how exercises are done, how to uh, shape our lifestyle, both physically as well as mentally, um, in order to uh, lead a healthy life. I think uh, Mr. Thanura Bevardhana um, gave the content uh, more than enough. I think we got a really good understanding. So our topic is active lifestyle and ergonomics for busy bodies. Another part of our topic is still missing, that is ergonomics. I think you all have heard of the term this ergonomic. We have heard of ergonomic keyboards, ergonomic mouse, uh, those terms. But do we really have uh, the proper understanding? Do we really know what this ergonomic concept really is? This ergonomic concept is a really, really important concept in the medical career and don't worry, Mr. Shehan Tenwara is ready to explain and discuss about this content in more detail. So, time is yours, Mr. Shehan Tenwara. Thank you, Diniti. Thank you, Tanra, for the wonderful presentation on uh, physical activity and uh, how we can manage it. So, I hope uh, everyone can hear me clearly. So, we can hear you clearly. Perfect. So uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I think we are due for power cut uh, very soon, but I can continue uh, without my video if that happens. Uh, it's how it is these days. But uh, let me give you a small introduction about myself. Uh, I am, of course, a physiotherapist. And my uh, basically my uh, expertise is in identifying why people get into pain and helping them get out of it. So when I go through, when I went through this uh, entire process for the last five to six years, something that I understood was ergonomics plays a key role, but ergonomics is still in its infancy, even though we've been uh, studying ergonomics for quite a long time. We haven't really understood the everything of it, or we haven't really brought things into uh, practice and policy that much. So. When it comes to a uh, medical setting, a healthcare setting, ergonomics is very important. So we will have to see why is it important, how we can relate it to our practical day-to-day -day lives, and how we can use it to guide and uh, help ourselves get out of injury and pain in the workplace. So my topics today that I will cover are what is ergonomics, the common ergonomic issues that are faced by healthcare professionals, such as uh, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, and everyone who might be working in healthcare setting. And the biggest uh, biggest factor that are, that is being discussed in terms of ergonomics is controlling posture or controlling how you work the 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 work environment. Is that the key? Or? for all the issues that people face in the workplace and what we can do to minimize ergonomic issues through physical activity because physical activity is something that's solely lacking in today's uh, environment, today's lifestyle basically. So ergonomics is simply the study of work. So it's a combination of two words. Ergo is the study, uh, sorry, ergo is uh, work and economics is the study. So it's a Greek word which combines the form the study of work. Why do we study work? If you take our normal day-to-day -day lifestyle, uh, whether, it's if, whether if you're a student, whether you are a working professional, we spend about eight to 12 hours per day at a certain place, a workplace, and that guides most of what we do, how we behave, and what we do for about 20, 30, 40 years of our lives. So if for a student, that's either school, or a university, a college, or a working professional. It can be their office, it can be a site outside, or a medical uh, professional, it will be a hospital or clinic. So 
why do we study ergonomics in these places are number one we need to create comfortable workplaces so that we can work eight to twelve hours per day for 20 30 years so it has to be comfortable we need to reduce injuries and illnesses that can spring from the workplace and when i go over the next couple of slides you'll see why that is important we need to maximize our efficiency or productivity in a hospital. That's very important. You cannot be running all over the place and not being efficient when you are trying to save a life. And I think doctors and nurses know this best. And we need to improve the quality of uh, our uh, working life. So those are the four main pillars of why people study ergonomics and why we are trying to bring better ergonomic principles into uh, any workplace. So to preface that, let me just give you this idea. Tanra, of course, spoke about this uh, briefly in this uh, presentation. But healthcare jobs are listed among the top 10 most unhealthy professions in the world. So if you take a look at any list, and there was one list that was uh, done by Google, it listed top 40 unhealthy work. Uh, top 40 unhealthy professions uh, in terms of the US, but I think it applies worldwide. Within the top 10, there were seven healthcare jobs. So uh, mainly they were uh, dental, dental surgery, uh, medical laboratory technology, radiologists, but you get the idea. Healthcare professionals are supposed to be the professionals that make other people healthy, general population healthy, but we ourselves are unhealthy. So if we start from a point of unhealthiness, it's difficult for us to make someone else healthy, even though we are trying, and we are succeeding, we can do better by being healthier. So that is the preface I want to start this topic by. But why is why are healthcare professionals unhealthy? So that's because health settings are slightly different to say an office space, and it's in several ways. One good thing about healthcare work is there's little sitting time involved. A doctor or nurse does not get to sit around too much. They generally move about. They, they might have less than four hours of sitting time unless they are working in a clinic, like consulting patients throughout the day seated. But in a ward, in hospital, they would have very little sitting time. So more less than four hours on average. But they have a lot of physical work involved in terms of their uh, hospital setting. They would be walking, they would be running, they would be carrying things, equip medical equipment, otherwise they would be lifting patients. So there's a lot of physical work involved. So that's that's all one in one way, it's a good thing. In another way, it could also be something that's, that's a little bit uh, bad in terms of their own health, the, the medical professional's health. The third reason why medical settings can be unhealthy is because of night shifts and poor sleep patterns that arise from it, but that's the nature of the job. Health, healthcare settings are supposed to be around 24 hours of the day, and somebody has to cover that shift. And also healthcare settings can be distressing. Can It's not only the physical factor that we look at, it's a mental factor as well. When you have to look at, when you have to take care of people who are ill, or people who are dying, or if, if somebody dies on your watch, that's distressing. So that can definitely affect you mentally and physically. So this is why healthcare settings are different, but this is why we also need to understand ergonomics in trying to cover up these issues as best as it can and try to bring some semblance of health back into healthcare professionals' lives. So in terms of musculoskeletal health for healthcare professionals, we see a very distressing trend. Back and neck pain are on the rise for healthcare professionals like doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, you name it. Uh, this is just one small example of what kind of issues that can arise from health. Work. But when you take back and neck pain, we see a huge trend. The longer you work, the more back and neck pain a doctor or a nurse might get. And that's just two common injuries that they get. There might be many others. So again, it has to be related to the way they work. They run around, they lift patients, they carry things around, they don't sleep much, 
they have some very stressful uh, work. So, however, the problem doesn't start from the time they start work. So it's not like, okay, somebody becomes a doctor now and now their back and neck pain starts. It actually starts from the time they are an undergraduate. So neck and back pain are on the rise in undergraduates as well in the medical profession. So some of these studies outline that, okay, uh, undergraduates from the first year onwards, the first year they are mainly okay, but the more they get into the undergraduate period and medical pro medical professions can sometimes have six or seven years of uh, university time, they become more and more uh, prone to pain. And that mainly is neck pain or back pain. So when you consider medical students, about 50% of them have back pain when they go through their undergraduate period. And about 60% of them have neck pain. And this is where ergonomics plays a role. Even a university is an ergonomic setting. It has to be healthy. It has to be comfortable. It has to keep people injury and uh, illness free. And like I said, this is only back and neck pain, the stats I put up here. You cannot forget how uh, people become obese or overweight or even underweight when they go through their uh, undergraduate period. People get a severe depression. I've seen it happen firsthand. Sorry, guys, like I said, uh, power cuts, I think, right on schedule. But I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, like I was saying, uh, just to give you a bit of an uh, experience from my uh, my own uh, undergraduate period that was about uh, now eight years ago. Uh, when I started my uh, first year in the university, I was about 72, 73 kilos. And when I went through that first year, I lost close to about 12 kilos. The main reason for that is, you know, it's a new uh, it's a new start. You go through quite a bit in your first year. You have anatomy, you have biochemistry, you have microbiology, all this stuff, you know, you had to cram into your head. Uh, and you get scared of the exams. It's it's all very distressing. So there was no time to exercise. There was no time to even eat sometimes. So I lost, lost a lot of weight. I would say I, I was very unhealthy in that starting my second year and completing the entire uh, four years of my physiotherapy undergraduate. So uh, that was a very unhealthy period. But fortunately, I work in a field where physical activity is also a core part of my daily life. So once I started working, I was able to improve on that and get back to a healthier version of myself. But a hospital setting really allows that. So that's where we have to do better from our undergraduate period itself. So just to uh, again summarize on that, we have to look at the risk factors. Why do people, why do undergraduates, why do medical professionals get into pain? So one thing is the sedentary lifestyle. Sorry. Uh, was there a question there? I'm happy to answer any questions if there is. Okay. okay. So uh, sedentary lifestyle and low physical activity, two sides of the same coin. So that is one main reason why uh, undergraduates uh, go through this issue. Then the high demands of academia, it's, it's, it's a medical profession. You are going to study, you have to study, you have to become better at it. So that's stressful by itself. Exam times, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of my clients uh, coming during exam times, whether it's medical or any other uh, thing that they're studying. Exam time is stressful by itself and that can create a lot of pain and injury. And the last one is poor sleep and rest. I can't recover this one already, but that's basically uh, four main risk factors of why someone get into pain. Then there are a couple of other things uh, that are a little bit more uh, questionable. Now, these are also covered by research. And does anyone think their posture is a risk factor for pain? You know, how you sit, how you stand, or how you do something that's basically 
the posture that we are talking about here, ergonomic posture, is that a risk factor for pain? If anyone has an answer to that. My point of view, I think it is. All right. So we will we'll discuss that. Ne the next slide is basically about that. Then the next point is the usage of laptops and phones. Uh, is you know using a laptop a risk factor for pain? Is using your phone a risk factor for pain? I mean, everyone has their phone nowadays in their hand, right? And whenever you sit, you look at your phone. You are just scrolling through it. Uh, you would have your laptop with you when you're studying, when you are at, at the university, and you would be using it. So, is the is the latest trend in using the laptop and phone a risk factor of pain? Is that something that you should be worried about, basically? Yes. So, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, basically, like I said. Uh, in terms of ergonomic practices, a lot has been spoken about posture. And basically the entire idea for the last uh, 30, 40 years maybe has been that, okay, there's a certain way you have to sit, there's a certain way you have to stand, especially if you're working in an office uh, or if you're studying or if you're using your phone, if you're using your computer or if you're writing, if you're reading. There's a certain way to do it. There's a right way to do it. And that has given rise to the, uh, the given rise to the concept of ideal posture. But there's, uh, there's a lot that is a little bit off about this point. And we are, we are slowly starting to understand that for the last five, 10 years, maybe. And we are trying, we are slowly starting to move away from it. The biggest points that I can make against the ideal posture argument is, now I see a lot of people with pain, right? And they are from various backgrounds. They are from officers, corporate officers. They are from uh, maybe like outdoor work, construction work. They are from, uh, even from medical uh, professionals, I see some clients. So some of them have perfect posture. So they when they are sitting down, they sit down in a very nice way. They have they have their office spaces set up so that the screen is directly in front of their eyes. There, so the eye, at eye line, their elbows are rested, their knees are at ninety degrees. It's exactly what you would see in that top picture of the ideal sitting posture, the touted ideal sitting posture. Then I see people who don't have the ideal at all. They are slouched. Their uh, elbows are just. Uh, you know, way, way off, their computer is not at eye level at all, their knees are wherever, they sometimes sit on the bed, they lie down on the bed and work. So the main point is, both of these have pain. Both of these types of people have pain and they come to see me. And then I see people who have very poor posture have no pain, none whatsoever in 20, 30 years of work. And then I also see people with ideal posture who have no pain. So four types of people exist, whether they have ideal posture or not, and whether they have pain associated with that or not. So that led to the idea that maybe posture does not have that much of a, a direct causation towards pain. It certainly has a correlation. For example, if you take a person in pain, they have back or neck pain, you are likely to find that they have a different posture that is mostly to combat the effect of the pain itself. You know, when you are in pain, what's the first thing you do? You try to find something that's comfortable to do. If you're having neck pain, you tilt your head in a certain way so that you can still keep your head upright and work. If you have back pain, you would kind of, you know, compromise on your sitting position maybe tilt to one hip or the other, cross your leg in a way, one way or another, so that you can still work mildly comfortably with that back pain. So the research answers this question. So there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of effect or causality of posture on pain. So we don't really need to conform to the ideal or the ideal that has been stated all this time just to be out of pain. 
So that's the number one ergonomic uh, principle that has come out in the last five to 10 years. And we are trying to understand it more and more so that we can essentially help people who are in pain at workplaces and universities studying basically to get better or get out of their pain. So to answer this question about risk factors, so these four are very well researched and understood and definitely these four have a massive impact on if someone is going to get pain or not. But these two, posture and the usage of laptops and phones does not have a very high effect or causation on pain. So moving on then. If anyone has any questions about that, I can definitely answer. Basically, when I speak about these two corporate officers, at corporate officers and people who are working eight to 10 hours a day, they definitely have a lot of questions on this, but we can also answer questions at the end as well, if you prefer. If there are no questions, I can move on. Sounds good. So, like I said, there is no perfect posture, but what is comfortable for you at that particular moment in time is what is ideal for you. So pick a comfortable chair, pick a comfortable table, put the laptop or phone at whatever height you want it to be and use that if that is comfortable. So comfortability is number one when it comes to ergonomics and being out of pain. So what is comfortable for you is your ideal at that uh, moment in time. However, having said that, posture is not equal to pain. Having said that, it does not mean posture has no effect on pain at all. If you stay in the same posture for a long time, then research says that that can lead to pain. So if you are just going to be sitting down in the same way, for eight to 10 hours a day, for about one year, two years, that can definitely lead to neck and back pain. If you are going to be uh, doing something, whether it's uh, sitting, gardening, studying, or carrying something in the same way over and over and over again, that can lead to pain. So that is why the next point I'm about to make is very important. Moving about, not being in the same posture for long periods is the key to get out of pain. So just to summarize again, posture is not equal to pain, but the same posture or the sedentary posture is something that can lead to pain and movement is the key out of it. So this is why we are trying to design workplaces, design workplaces more ergonomically by allowing for movement, by allowing for more freedom of movement and not putting people in the same posture over and over. So as a student, how would this matter to you? So I know a lot of students, they put a high emphasis on, again, like people in corporate offices in thinking, okay, I, I have to sit in a certain way if I'm studying, I have to sit ramrod straight 90 degrees at, hip, at the hip and knee and keep my head upright and study. I never studied like that when I was in my undergraduate period. I studied on a bed, most likely, right? So just lying down on the bed, just keeping my book or whatever in front of me and study. Uh, so is that good or bad? Back then, I thought that was bad. Now I know that is fine as long as I'm comfortable. But people are afraid of it. People still come to me and ask, okay, uh, I got neck pain yesterday. And probably it has to do with the way I studied or the way I worked. I worked on the bed. I kept my laptop in front of me and I worked. And is that why I got my pain? Uh, but then I do a thorough assessment on them and then I find out, okay, they have a very stressful presentation coming up in the next couple of days or they have an exam coming up in the next couple of days. That is more likely to be the cause of their pain, the mental stress that they're going through rather than the way they work. So then I would advise them on how to manage their stress or how to tackle it a little bit better so that their pain would go away. Rather than trying to address a postural problem that we don't really find based on research. So that is uh, what I want to outline in this part of the presentation. 
And coming back to that uh, mental stress and other types of stress and how that can affect pain. So how does injuries and pain happen? So that I can explain by using a glass analogy. So imagine your life or yourself as a glass. So how big the glass is, how much of capacity you have for uh, tackling stress or managing stress. The bigger the glass, the better capacity you have. The smaller the glass, the less capacity. So how do you make the glass bigger or small? How, how does it become smaller is through several things. One is if you're a person who's not getting enough sleep or quality sleep, that would lead to a smaller glass. If you're not getting regular physical activity or quality physical activity, again, that could lead to a smaller glass. If you're having any acute or chronic diseases, illnesses, if you're suffering from any uh, mental uh, illness, well, not mental illness, but uh, mental challenges at the moment, then that can lead to a smaller glass. But if you're medically healthy, if you get regular physical activity and you have quality sleep and proper nutrition, then that would that means you would have a bigger glass. The the things that we fill into this glass are emotional stress. So that's from family, friends, uh, partners. Uh, any other life challenge that you're going through. Then you have studying and financial stress. Financial stress might not uh, really matter to you at this point in your time since you are still studying, but that's also a significant amount of stress. Then you have physical stress. Physical stress is what you go through in your day-to-day -day life. If you're working, if you're working in the healthcare, especially doctors would go through a lot of physical stress. Uh, they are running around the entire day. So when you combine all of these three things together, that and this is very subjective, but when you put them into that glass, if you have smaller glass, it will overflow. And based on the amount that it will overflow, that most likely would result in pain. But if you have a bigger glass, the glass would not overflow. It would be contained and you would be able to manage. And most of the time, that is how people stay pain free, pain no injury free in their workplace. So ways to tackle this, like I said, is regular physical activity and quality sleep and managing any medical issues that you may have. But that is, of course, you would be more expert at that than me. So let's move on. Physical activity. So this is a question that I get or almost daily, whenever somebody who works quite a bit comes and sees me, uh, they would find something on the internet. Uh, it, it says, okay, uh, I'm uh, sitting down for eight to 10 hours a day. And I see that, okay, uh, it leads to various things like NCDs, it leads to, uh, you know, cancer even. And basically, I can't get out of it though. I'm, I have to work eight to 10 hours a day. I have to do it seated. Uh, how would I basically become healthier? So, based on this study that this uh, uh, study done in 2016, it's a it's a very good study. It's done on a million men and women, and they basically checked people who work long hours, people who work more than eight hours a day, and they are uh, they are risk of mortality. So they covered all bases like NCDs and everything and how physical activity will change it. And what they found was, even if you sit more than eight hours a day, continuous, no break, if you were to be able to do at least 30 minutes of moderate exercise per day, you can count at the risk of sitting, the risk of mortality by sitting and essentially be a little bit more healthier. Of course, it's better to not sit 8 to 10 hours a day, but sometimes we can't help it. Uh, being medical students, studying might be something that you have to do. So you might have to sit, maybe not 8 to 10 hours, but somewhere around 4 to 5 hours a day, you might have to study or sit in lectures or basically do something seated, assignments maybe. But you don't have to worry about anything such as NCDs or you know basically your health if you still get some physical activity done for that day. So basically sitting is contacted by physical activity or sedentary lifestyle is contacted by physical activity. So that's 
the first thing then another uh, article the another research that is a little bit uh, not controversial but a little uh, so uh, another thing that is a little bit of a paradox is that okay in my first uh, slide i said now in the first slide where i explained ergonomics i said this so healthcare professionals have less sitting time so less than four hours a day and they have a lot of physical work. so then where's the problem uh do you do you, where do you see the problem because they have less sitting time than a formal office and they have a lot of physical work so they still get physical activity done right so where's the problem then why do they still get you know 50 60 percent of back and neck pain and that was answered a little bit like this and a lot of uh healthcare professionals that come see me they they essentially discuss this they are like i still walk around the hospital I get about eight to 10,000 steps per day when I uh, check it on my activity tracker. Uh, and sometimes I walk back home as well. My quarters is just next to the hospital, so I walk back home. I don't drive. I don't uh, take an elevator, I climb steps. So is my activity level enough? Is that enough to be held? But there's a paradox. Just because you're active also sometimes doesn't mean it's healthy. So occupational leisure time physical activity are two different things. Uh, and up until very recently, we thought they were the same thing that you can basically, you know, walk at work, or walk for work and walk for leisure and both would give the same benefits. However, now we have started to understand that simply walking at work Oh, so physical activity at work is not really enough to give the same benefits as doing physical activity for fun or physical activity for some other benefit like aesthetic. So simply to get fitter. Uh, don't get me wrong. Physical activity is still physical activity. Even if you do it for occupational reason, that will still impart some benefit, but it's not as enough as leisure time physical activity. So that is why People who still work in a healthcare setting can benefit from leisure time physical activity outside of the hospital, even if they walk around or do a lot of physical act, physical things inside the hospital or inside their workplace. So basically, this study uh, was done and they checked for leisure time physical activity and how would that re how would that relate to lifetime uh, illnesses, and they found that okay, uh, people who work in very physical demand jobs, like uh, even healthcare, construction work and all that, uh, would still not really benefit from it all that much unless they do leisure time physical activity outside. So uh, office worker who sits around all day but goes to the gym or goes for a run or goes for a walk, 30 minutes outside of their office would still be healthier than a construction worker who works eight hours in very physically demanding jobs. So that is the paradox of occupational and leisure time physical activity. So that's something that healthcare professionals have to be very concerned about. Always be mindful to get some physical activity outside of the work environment. Then uh, sleep, of course, uh, Tanu spoke on sleep and recovery, so I don't want to cover it that much, but quality sleep is essential. Uh, more than seven hours, so you know, at least seven hours minimum is the goal here. And some things that I will simply touch up on based on, you know, because uh, medical students and medical professionals have irregular bedtimes, they have night shifts to cover for casualty and all that. So another uh, study that I haven't really put up here, but uh, another study that sp speaks on night shift work essentially outlines that, yes, it's better to get sleep at night. But if you are doing night shift work where you cannot get sleep at night, then the next best thing is to have regular bedtimes. So if you're someone who's always working night shift, simply have a regular bedtime. You know, whenever you get off the night shift, maybe that's at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. If you are a person who always goes to sleep at 10 a.m., then go to sleep at 10 a.m. every day if possible, and then wake up at a set time. 
don't compromise on your bed regular bedtime because outside of getting sleep at night having regular bedtimes is the second most important thing when it comes to quality sleep and the rest of course uh, follows i'm sure these are something that you know keep your bedroom cool that will help you get better sleep uh, go outside as soon as you wake get some sunlight because that essentially controls your circadian rhythm reduce caffeine if possible but healthcare professionals i know some of them of course have a lot of caffeine just to keep through that energy for the, for the day so those are some simple things that you can do to have quality sleep and the uh, very minimum that you can do in how to remain active during your busy schedule is uh, basically i uh, cut it down to two things cardio and strength training uh, 10 minutes a day of a cardio of your choice uh, 10 to 20 minutes a day of a strength training routine of your choice it can be anything so it's uh, walking cycling swimming running yoga gym it can be anything it doesn't really matter what matters is you get it outside of your workplace and then try to cover 8,000, 10,000 steps per day that, of course, you would easily get if you're working in a hospital setting, I have no doubt. And then trying to complete the weekly goal of achieving at least 150 minutes of physical activity. So those are some simple steps in how to remain active with a busy schedule for healthcare professionals. And that's basically it key takeaways are stay active and that will help you lead a healthy life when it comes to ergonomics posture is not the key here but being active being a person who is having healthy movement is the key so i hope that uh, covers up a lot of misconceptions people might have in terms of you know studying working in very stressful environments if there are any questions I can basically answer them. Uh, I hope I haven't taken up too much time. I, it's 9.15 already, so up to you. Yeah, actually, uh, you gave us a storehouse of knowledge about this ergonomics. I wish we had uh, some more time, uh, but uh, we'll be open uh, for at least a few questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? I would just like to say, uh, in the interest of time as well, if there are no, no questions, if there are questions that you would like to ask me later, this is my contact details. You can easily contact me at any of these uh, through any of these uh, as well. So, the concept of ergonomics, uh, which is uh, really important and relevant uh, to us, especially in the medical career, you gave it a very um, clear and better understanding for us. Actually, uh, that um, model of the glass model uh, concept, I found it really, really interesting. Uh, and also, we uh, the as I understood, the major concept of this ergonomics is the comfort. Uh, that is uh, uh, the basic uh, concept that we got through this ergonomics. Uh, is it correct, sir? Uh, that is uh, quite correct, Dinti. I mean, if you really take a look at it, uh, now humans have about 10,000 history of 10,000 year history of uh, basic, uh, basic history that we know of, right? And ever since we really started to come out of our caves, the number one thing we were looking at is comfort, you know, clothes, how to sleep better. How to that's why we built villages that's why we build, build cities more comfortable houses and now more comfortable workplaces so comfort is number one that's what we are looking for and in the workplace that also should be the key thing in driving our uh basically driving our health and productivity I think uh, we got a very clear understanding about that concept. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for clearing us all these facts and taking time and dedicating your effort into this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dinti and uh, Dr. Latika and the organizing committee for giving us this opportunity. I wish uh, we had more time to answer questions and all that, but uh, we've taken up quite a bit of time. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to answer any of your questions. If you want, 
please message me anything time. Thank you. Good night. Questions in the audience who couldn't uh, express themselves during this time because of the time limitations, I guess. Uh, you have the opportunity here to get in touch with our guest speakers uh, via social media and also uh, from the website uh, TAS uh, LK. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's time to wind up. I, I really wish we had uh, more time. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thanura Bevardhana, as well as uh, Mr. Shehan Tenwara for dedicating your time, effort and every, for everything. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone in the audience also for joining with us uh, in the sixth webinar series uh, organized by Aura Media. Uh, thank you very much for everyone on behalf of uh, Aura Media, uh, Medical Faculty Ragama. Uh, and then um, as the time is ticking, it's time to wind up. Uh, so next, uh, with a valuable discussion like this one, uh, we'll meet up again with the seventh webinar program uh, organized by Aura Media. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>